the healthcare dynamic is rapidly changing. Understanding the basic fundamentals related to the business of medicine empowers practitioners to advance their skills in and knowledge of the business aspects of medicine. SMA's Business of Medicine Simplified Program explores the essentials of everything from reimbursement and compensation models, insurance and risk management, to practice employment and business finance. Dr. Feldman, thank you for joining me today. Um, so I was able to read a few articles that you've published on the topic of pharmaceutical benefits managers and found the more I read, the more questions I had. So uh, first question is, let's start with a brief description and a little history lesson on pharmacy benefit managers, what they are, um, who they work for, and what they do in general. Well, first off, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Um, pharmacy benefit managers and, you know, their behaviors, et cetera, uh, has been a, a probably consuming in my um, time for the last few years. When I'm not seeing patients, I seem to be reading about and talking about pharmacy benefit managers. So initially when they started, they, they really did play an important role in the healthcare market in general. Um, they basically serve as middlemen for insurance plans between the, they adjudicate the pharmacy claims. So insurance companies really like to handle doctor visits, hospital visits, um, kinds of medications that are given in either doctor's offices or um, hospitals. In Medicare, those are referred to as the Part B uh, medications. But as more and more drugs came to market, it became unwieldy for the insurance companies to handle all the pharmacy benefits, that is, the, the, the drugs that people would get when they went to the drugstore. So yeah. entities known as pharmacy benefit managers came into existence. I think it may have even started back with Medicaid. But in the 90s, um, actually, pharmaceutical manufacturers wanted to own PBM. And uh, you may remember Merck Medco. Medco is a, a pharmacy benefit manager that was acquired by Merck. However, the, the Federal Trade Commission came in and said, you know, we don't think that that's a good idea. We can't have a manufacturer owning a middleman that determines um, what drugs patients take, you know, through yeah. formularies. So they said, they put the kibosh on that and said, no, that can't happen. So there was another one, um, a couple other manufacturers. So that went away, and PBMs sort of became standalone companies. And initially, uh, like I said, their role was to uh, handle the, the, the pharmacy benefit uh, for the, uh, the beneficiaries of insurance companies. But they grew and became more powerful um, as the years went on, when they saw that there was a, a way, instead of just getting a fee for handling the pharmacy benefits, um, they could um, actually tie their income to various things. For example, spread pricing. Spread pricing is where the pharmaceutical uh, manufacturer basically charges a certain amount to the PBM. And usually it's lower um, than what they have the employer or the insurance company pay them for the drug. So in that way, there's a spread on the amount that they spend on the drug and the amount that they're reimbursed on the drug. And then as specialty drugs, you know, the, the expensive drugs and a lot of the drugs that I use, the, the so-called biologic drugs, came out in the late 90s and early 2000s, these became very difficult to, um, I guess, manage is the term that, that insurance companies use. Um, so they, they went to their PBMs to somehow figure out a way that could reduce their costs for these very expensive drugs. And that created um, the tiering system with formularies you know, formularies for whoever is listening to this if they don't know what that is, that is the list of drugs that the insurance company or payer will pay for. If the drug isn't on the formulary, um, the patient can get the drug, the doctor can prescribe the drug, 
but they will have to pay for it on their own. It won't be covered. So that gets into formulary construction, and that's de that's determined by the PBM, not the plan, really. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah, so PBM they 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 work for big insurance companies, and all of that changed this year when they were either bought or bought by big insurance companies, or employers could directly uh, contract with the PBM. Um, so it was either insurance companies or employers or states. Um, you know, Medicaid programs, the state would contract with the PBM. But yes, they would leave it up to the PBM to construct the formulary. And getting on the formulary um, is is uh, a touchy subject because manufacturers <laughs> really want to be on the formulary because particularly if their drug is expensive, if it isn't on the formulary, no one's going to take the drug. I don't care how good that drug is unless we <laughs> payer is going to pay for it. So it, there's competition to get onto the formulary. Um, and PBMs are the ones that construct the formulary and only PBMs know how much they ultimately pay for the drug. Um, those companies, insurance companies, employers who hire the PBM, they have no idea how much that drug costs the PBM. The PBM then we'll go to the insurance company and say, we will set up the formularies. We will get rebates, meaning we will get money back from the manufacturer every time we um, uh, fill the script. And we will pass perhaps some of it back to you. Um, in the past, they really did not pass a lot of the rebates back. So what right. would happen is a, a beneficiary, so say an Anthem, and this just happened a few years back, um, an Anthem beneficiary would go to the drugstore and pick up a very expensive drug. Um, Anthem would pay the price for it. Um, the PBM would, when that script was filled, would receive money back from the manufacturer and a certain amount of it might go back to the Anthem who paid the price for the, for the drug. Right. Well, Anthem found out that they were not getting all of the money back from this particular PBM with Express Scripts. And right. so they sued Express Scripts and said, you know, we're not getting all of the money back. And eventually they fired Express Scripts. This was maybe wow. four years ago. And... Um, so insurers became wise to and employers. Um, well, there's all these rebates that PBMs are getting back, and we're not we're not um, benefiting from it. So yeah. PBMs started passing some of it back. The bigger the employer, the larger percentage of rebate that was passed back. But there are still many small employers that do not get that rebate. And um, as a uh, a graph came out. I think it was based on 2017 numbers on what employers do with that rebate. You know, the the sort of the the meme out there is that these rebates go back to lower premiums, and that's sort of the PBM's um, take on it. And at least that's what they say. We pass these rebates back, and because of that, it lowers premiums. When you look at what employers do with those rebates when they do get them. Less than 15% yeah. of the time it goes to lowering rebates. It usually just goes to the bottom line to pay for the drug cost. So it's, so, a, it's, a, it's a revenue source for the, the, the company, basically. Yes, and, and the biggest revenue source is for the middleman. Um, and then it's the, the other thing what has happened over the years is the pharmacy benefit manager has reclassified rebates as fees. And there was a contract... Um, between uh, Express Scripts and um, basically pointing out what was a rebate and what was a fee. And there was an entire list of fees that were not to be passed back to the sponsor, meaning not to be passed back to the insurance company or the employer. So if you have right. something known as a formulary rebate and you reclassify it as an administration fee, what you need to pass back to the employer or the or the insurance company shrinks and what you get to keep for yourself increases. And we've seen that happen. Formulary rebates, at one point, the average was about 50%. And that has gone down in the last year or so. 
the, the employer can add lots of transparency to the contract with the pharmacy benefit manager, the ability to audit the contract, the ability to um, uh, see perhaps how much formulary rebates are given back to the, to the pharmacy benefit manager. However, the sponsor, the employer, or the insurance company still has no idea um, about what is in the contract between the PBM and the manufacturer. That is not part of the transparency to the employer. Um, let me give you an example of an employer who seemingly benefited from no longer using a PBM to negotiate with the manufacturers and set up their formulary. About, gosh, it's probably going on 14 or 15 years ago, Caterpillar, the very large national company that ensures all of its workers around the company was noticing their drug spend was going up. So what they did was, and we spoke from, I, I'm president of an organization called the Coalition of State Rheumatology Organizations, and actually two years ago we spoke to the human resources at Caterpillar to verify this, this story that we had heard. And yeah. um, it, it, Caterpillar took over uh, constructing their own formularies and use Express Scripts more as a fee-only type of uh, benefit manager. After doing that, now we spoke to HR probably two years ago, and it had been 12 years, so at this point it's probably 14 years ago. And between the time that they did that and when we spoke to HR, Caterpillar did not increase health insurance premiums for their employees by one penny. I don't know of any other company, certainly not, I mean, I have a private practice and I buy health insurance for my employees, and I can tell you health insurance goes up every year. Now, yeah. can I say for a fact that getting rid of Express Scripts saved them so much money that they didn't have to increase their premiums? No, but there certainly is a very close association. Um, wow. So, yeah, so the, so, the, so the talk that PBMs give, that they keep premiums down, I, I'm not so certain that, that that's always the case about the, the formulary construction, because this part, this is the, this is the really, um, I think, um, misaligned incentive in terms of formulary construction that a lot of people don't understand. Um, we always think that competition lowers prices. So obviously, the more um, manufacturers trying to get onto the formulary, you would think they're competing with each other. Therefore, their prices should come down in order to get onto the formulary. Well, competition can do two things. Competition can lower prices. And the example that I give is if you're building a house. All things being equal, none of the contractors are your brother-in-law and quality similar. The more contractors bidding, they tend to try to underbid because, for the most part, you'll probably um, choose the one that costs you the least, that's the lowest cost. So the more competition, it brings down the price. However, if you're selling your house and you've got that one house on the block that everyone wants, the more people bidding on your house, sometimes they do overbid. They bid as high as they possibly can in order to get the house. So in that situation, competition raises prices. So in the world of formulary construction, unfortunately, it's the highest price concession that gets you on the preferred tier. And what that means is not only the rebate, but other concessions that are thrown in, whether it's admin fees, price protection fees, and generally all of these rebates and fees are based on the list price of the drug. So in order to get a higher price concession, there's three variables. You've got your list price, you've got the discount that you promised, and then you've got your market share. So an example is if, if a manufacturer's drug costs $1,000 a month and they've told the PBM, every time you fill a script, I'll give you 50% back. So every time you, you fill a script for that $1,000, you're going to get $500 back. So the more scripts that are filled, the bigger the market share that drug has, that improves their, their bid. Well, someone else comes along, and their drug $2,000 a month, and they're willing to give a 50% rebate. 
So which sure. drug do you think the PBM is going to put as preferred? The one where they oh, make $500 yeah. or the one that they make $1,000? So consequently, that's the, the misaligned incentive. Their incentive is to have the highest price concession possible. And I'm going to tell you, when it, it, it's not based on, you know, you can't have a drug that doesn't work. There, there are nuances among drugs that physicians should really have the ability to choose the correct medicine for the patient. But no, we are forced to use the drugs that make the most money for the PBMs first. That's called step therapy or fail first. We must use the preferred drugs and the reason why they're preferred and the PBMs will tell you, I'm sorry, I can't put this lower price drug on because I will lose the rebate from the higher price drug and I'll make less money. You know, and they, they couch it in terms of, and your premiums will have to go up. But we've seen when PBMs are not involved, premiums actually drop. So that's kind of a specious argument. You know, it's nice that they can automatically increase premiums when their bottom line goes down. But, you know, when you take a company like Express Scripts that's no longer a single entity, but it's owned by Cigna, and they're number 22 on the Fortune 500, higher than any of the pharmaceutical manufacturers, you know, you start yeah. sort of saying, you know, maybe this is egregious behavior, that they are yeah. maintaining higher list prices in order to keep their bottom line. When we're saying we have a drug pricing crisis in the United States, um, it just doesn't make sense that that's a system that we've perpetuated. So it sounds like middlemen, for lack of a better term, have simply developed new revenue streams by becoming PBMs. When they saw how much money PBMs make and how much money they were maybe skimming off. So, for example, um, uh, Cigna, who did not own its own PBM, um, decided that it wanted to buy Express Scripts because Express Scripts was probably, you know, keeping some money from them in, in contracts and, and PBMs make money hand over fist. Um, yeah. Their profits, you know, they really, they, they don't do any research. They make no, they make no medication. They don't even take control. They have no inventory. They are strictly middlemen and their profits based on their assets are the highest in the industry. So they, why wouldn't an insurance company want to own a PBM? And then, of course, sure. CVS Caremark is a PBM, um, the part of CVS Health, and they managed to scrape together $68 billion to buy Aetna. Um, so we know that the, the, the PBMs are, are a very profitable um, industry. Wow, this is um, excellent information. Um, so please opine on the recent pullback from the CMS proposed rule that would effectively shifted rebates from PBMs and given it to the patients when they pay for their prescriptions? Well, let's go back to uh, CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid um, proposed rule that came out earlier this year. So rebates are actually kickbacks. Um, and because of that, they needed to get what's known as safe harbor from the anti-kickback statute. So they were granted safe harbor back in the early 90s so that they would be able to take these kickbacks and not be prosecuted um, for taking a kickback. So they could call it a rebate and they were immune to prosecution from the anti-kickback statute. So the proposed rule that came out earlier this year would take away that safe harbor so that those rebates would then be culpable under the anti-kickback statute. So consequently, manufacturers could not give the rebate to the PBM. And the other thing that the proposed rule did, it created a safe harbor for patients when they went to pick up their drug at the pharmacy, they could accept the rebate and it wouldn't be considered a kickback an enticement oh. to take this drug. That's essentially what the, what the rule said. We're going to take away safe harbor from the PBMs and we're going to give it to the Medicare beneficiaries. Now, granted, they had to count on the you know, pharmaceutical manufacturers to give the same rebate back to the patients that they were going to give to the PBMs 
in order to right. add a spot on the formulary. Um, but had manufacturers not done that, they would have been digging their own grave at that point. Um, <laughs> we were all very happy about this. As you can imagine, um, the KBMs were throwing a fit and saying this is going to increase premiums for Medicare beneficiaries. Essentially, they were saying, you're taking money away from us, so we're going to basically charge seniors more. Um, it's, again, that, that kind of behavior, no one seems to say, that's wrong. You know, this is a yeah. government program. But, you know, the other side of it, it would have taken it away from Medicaid as well, and that probably was not the best thing because the Medicaid patients already pay so little. It probably would have taken money away from state governments, and that aspect of the, the rule could have been taken out. Um, yeah. But instead, the federal government withdrew the rule completely, um, you know, and it really was a, a question of politics over, over patients because when there were many, many computations of how much the premiums would go up for Part D beneficiaries, and it probably was in the range of somewhere between 5 and $10 a month. So, yes, the premiums would have gone up. But when you think about it, the majority, let's say I think 30% of Medicare Part D beneficiaries actually get government subsidy to pay for those premiums. So that group would would be insulated from any increase in the premiums. All of the Medicare beneficiaries who pay their own premiums, yeah. 93% go to the drugstore to pick up a drug. And it probably would have only taken one drug and the savings they would have gotten on that one drug to more than pay for any increase in, um, in their premiums. So we've got 7% of the, the Part D beneficiaries that may not have benefited from this rule. But the vast majority who can't afford their drugs when they go would have gotten, you know, who knows how much. Could it have been 30%, 50% off the price of the drug? So that was not really a good argument. There were a couple of other things, you know, that the, the, the government would have ended up paying more in the long run. But it really did turn out to be... Um, the, the PBM lobbyists are extremely powerful in Washington, D.C. Consequently, that rule went away, and that was our best shot to have an immediate um, benefit, immediate relief to high drug costs for Medicare beneficiaries, and that just got, the rug got pulled out from under it. So the question is, do we see any legislation on the horizon that may um, in any way benefit consumers. Um, yes, yeah. yeah, there are both in the House and in the Senate. Um, but from what I've read in one of the, the Senate bills, they did have a provision where the, the, the patient, and we have to kind of backtrack a little bit on that because yeah. we have to talk about the list price versus the net price to the people. Do you see any legislation coming down the pipe that will help in, help improve this situation? Um, so I prescribe these biologic drugs, and I'd say the list price is somewhere between five and ten thousand dollars a month. The PBM may get it for anywhere between two and five thousand dollars a month, but then some right. friends charge the patient twenty percent on the list price. So if the list price, Ooh. you know, ten thousand dollars. The patients, if they've got a $10,000 deductible, I mean, they have to pay, you know, when they have a 20% a coinsurance, every time until they get to the $10,000, they have to come up with $2,000. Not 20% mm -hmm. of the 5000 hypothetically, that the PBM could be paying for the drug. So one of yeah. the provisions that was in um, one of the Senate bills would have allowed patients, consumers, to pay their coinsurance on the net price. And I just read that this got pulled. So that's, that's sad. And I can imagine why it got pulled. There's a lot of, um, the, the PBMs, again, probably were complaining yeah. that they would have to raise premiums if that happened because their bottom line would have been affected. Um, so probably the, the, the legislation that seems to be perhaps getting the most push is that of transparency. And yeah. there, there is a, a, a section in one of the Senate bills that basically states that 
the amount of the rebate, the amount of the fees, the price protection fees, et cetera, will need to be um, essentially shown to agencies and um, so they can see how much the PBM really is making. Um, that may stay in the bill or they, that may not stay in the bill. Um, so the, the Senate bill, Lower Health Care Cost Act, that's an Alexander Murray. Um, it's basically trying to do some transparency and accountability. Um, then they have uh, the finance um, bill. I, I think Senator Cassidy and Senator Kennedy from my state, which is Louisiana, um, they have something called the Fair Relief Act, and that's supposed to lower drug costs for elderly. And um, but again, this is uh, this is going to be tricky because of the lobbying on both sides. So there are things there. There is no final bill that has come through yet that's to be voted on by the entire House or the Senate. They, everything is still in committee, and I think they're trying to do transparency um, bills, which I suppose is the first step. But my suggestion would be to construct formularies based on the lowest price, not the yeah. highest price concession. Because then the incentive would be to get on the formulary, you've got to lower your list price. You know, unfortunately for the PBMs, that would cut into their income, so they in no way would like to have uh, that. But if you think about it, it, it would benefit the employers because the employers then um, would have the benefit of lower prices and their employees would have the benefit of paying a coinsurance on a lower price. So everyone would benefit but the pharmacy benefit managers if formulary construction was based on lowest price and not highest price concession. So if a business can contract directly with PBMs to reduce their costs within their health plans, then associations need to do more to educate them. Sounds like we've identified a topic for our next podcast. There's a there's a group called the Alliance for Transparent Affordable Prescriptions, and the American College of Rheumatology, along with the Coalition of State Rheumatology Organizations, as well as a number of other professional and patient um, groups have come together, and basically the mission is to educate not only legislators and regulators, but physicians, patients, and we have tried to start a thrust towards businesses to understand how this um, formulary construction affects their bottom line. The PMs yeah, exactly. have everyone, everyone convinced, including the employers, that they're saving them money. And it's a, it's a, um, you know, it's a mantra that's repeated over and over again. And they're actually, you know, now they have ads on television, you know, touting that they've saved, you know, over a hundred billion dollars from, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers over the last year in, you know, wrenching these discounts out of them. But they're not wrenching discounts on the price. They're, they're getting money back after the script has been filled. And I don't think that employers understand that they will save the same amount of money if it's actually a discount on the price. Um, right. PPM PBM said, well, employers have become addicted to the rebates that we're paying back to them, and they don't want to lose those rebates. Well, if they would explain to the employer, instead of paying $1,000 for a drug and we give you $250 back, you would only pay $750. They would save the same amount of money, but they have the business owners thinking they're making all this money on the rebates. They're just spending more money to get it back later. And I suspect yeah. that the PBM is probably getting the drug for $500 and, you know, and yet they're giving the employer $250 back. But the, but the manufacturer then really only got $500 for their drug. So if yeah. the manufacturer were to contract directly with the employer, Maybe they wouldn't give them fifty percent back. Maybe they give them thirty percent back. But the menu, but the but the employer would still be better off than getting a percentage of the rebate that the PBM gets back. I know it's a very complicated, and but business owners need to be made aware that there is a better way. 
and that they will still be able to save the same amount of money and maybe more if they would hire a transparent fee only PDF. They they are out there, um, but the big three, OptumRx, Express Scripts, and CVS Caremark, now that they're all either owned by or own an insurance company, um, this so-called vertical integration has really reduced the ability of uh, businesses to contract with a transparent fee only. Because if you're going to use Cigna as your health insurance company for your employers, employees, excuse me, um, yeah. you're probably going to need to use Express Scripts as their PDM. You yeah. can't. It's it's decreasing competition, and it was really sad that the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice saw nothing wrong with these mergers. So, Dr. Feldman, can you share any examples where physicians were able to influence formulary construction? Well, you know, pharmacy benefit managers like to say that they have P&T committees that, and these include pharmacists, they include physicians um, that look over, you know, the choices of medications and make recommendations to what's on the formulary. However, I have been in meeting where a new drug was coming into the rheumatoid arthritis space and they wanted to price themselves, list price, uh, 50% off of what the leading drug for rheumatoid arthritis was charging. And every single PBM representative that was in the room said, um, yes, we have P&T committees that go over the efficacy and safety of drugs. However, we can't put on a drug that's 50% off um, the, the leading drug because we would then lose the rebate from the leading drug and um, then 50% of our beneficiaries are taking that drug and we would then have to start paying twice as much for that drug. So we don't want a lower price. So yeah, there, there, is, there are professional health providers um, that make recommendations but the ultimate decision of what goes on to the formulary is all based on the amount of money that the PBM saves, in quotes. In, in speaking to physicians, you know, their jaws drop when they really understand that it's not the lowest price drug. You know, as physicians, all things being equal, I'm going to pick the lowest price drug for my patient. Right. You know, if, if everything, the, if the efficacy and safety is the same, I am going to pick the lowest price drug. So as physicians, we understand there's a cost to the patient that we need to respect in terms of our decision-making process of what's the best drug for the patient. If you can't afford it, I don't care how great the drug is, the patient's not going to be able to get it. So that That's is right. one of the considerations. However, we're being forced through step therapy to pick the drug that's the most profitable for the PBM. And not only does it take away from the doctor-patient relationship in terms of picking the right drug, but it's based on a monetary incentive for the middleman. And that really just, I think, is a moral injury to uh, physicians and our ability to, um, with the patient, make the correct decision. And again, if it was a lower cost to the patient, that definitely comes into consideration. But again, step therapy is based on those medications that make the most money for the PBM. PBM will tell you that, that they are the ones that are not in the position of power, that they now have to use those drugs to get the biggest rebates because if they try to use something else, those rebates will get taken away. In a way, yes, in the beginning, the pharmacy benefit manager has created the monster and now you have manufacturers that have up what, uh, what we call a rebate wall. And right. it, does, it does affect the amount that employers and um, PBMs will have to pay for drugs. So if you basically put in a contract where a lower price drug can come on, that manufacturer that, that has the rebate wall, they can threaten to take away their rebate and that would throw the accounting way off. So yes, at this point, um, everyone's to blame. 
there's just a, a big infrastructure now in between the the drug manufacturer and the patient ultimately and all that bureaucracy obviously is going to create um, all kinds of walls and barriers um, lots of middle players in the process that are um, keeping uh, or hindering access to the drugs that are needed um, by the patients and the patients and so um, uh, I guess um, is there is there anything um, that we may have not covered that you think is important to point out? I, I think sort of what you know what you basically said just now in terms of the system and it's not just PBMs and the manufacturers. Um, you know there are there are vendors in there and GPOs um, all that make more money when the list price goes up. So it's going to take a complete disruption of the system um, yeah. to, to turn this around. And that's a scary thing because there's going to be large companies that stop making as much money. Um, I'm not certain if it can happen. Um, that proposed rule from CMS taking away safe harbor on rebates to PBMs was eventually going to trickle down from Medicare to, to the commercial and, and the amount of fear in PBMs to lose that, um, lose all that money yeah. is, is essentially what, what made that, that rule go away. Um, so I'd like to, I'd like to think that there's hope, um, but the system needs to, uh, basically stand on its head and, and change completely before we see, um, I think, money, uh, well, the yeah. cost of drugs, prices of drugs to go down. I do have a couple additional questions around an article that I found on Stat News that looked pretty good, um, written by a, a gentleman named John Arnold. I don't know who he is, but okay, it was so awesome. John, yeah, John Arnold and John Arnold Foundation. Um, you know, we talk about this. They began um, funding Kaiser Health Family News, oh, I don't know, a few years ago. And, you know, for uh, for the most part, a lot of what John Arnold writes, I agree with. The only thing that I can think of is that someone in John Arnold's family must have been either hurt or killed by some type of pharmaceutical manufacturer policy or drug because he is so anti-manufacturers and he he brought in a little bit about him I'm not sure if we've read the same op-ed piece but um he brought in a little bit about PBM yeah. but it's almost as if anyone sheds any kind of light on anyone other than the manufacturer having any kind of responsibility for drug pricing um he shoots it down it's it, it's it's almost as if somehow sharing the blame takes away from the culpability of the manufacturer. And I, I've, at one point, I think, how can I set up a meeting with John Arnold to just find out where this venom for the manufacturers, and I, you know, I'm not pro-manufacturer by any stretch of the imagination. It's just that there are so many players in the drug distribution system that benefit from higher list prices to focus everything on manufacturers, you're never going to solve the problem. And um, so, yeah, that's, I probably read the, the John Arnold piece that you're talking about, but I'll be happy to, you know, give my take on, yeah. your, on Mr. And Arnold. I, it, was, it was an op-ed piece. It was August 2018. And um, just to maybe touch on those real quickly, um, mm -hmm. it, it, uh, so I read an opinion piece written by John Arnold published on statnews.com August 2018. The article was entitled, Are Pharmacy Benefit Managers the Good Guys or Bad Guys of Drug Pricing? One quote from the article makes the statement, as they currently operate, pharmacy benefit managers are part of the problem. But if incentives were realigned, pharmacy benefit managers could and should play more of a vital role in controlling runaway prices for prescription drugs. Do you agree with that, or I, if so, I, how I, might a change I, in their role help? No, I do agree with that. Now, it's a question of what you call um, sort of realign the incentive. 
because if you've read, you know, some of the things that I've written about and understand the incentive for the PBM um, is to have a higher list price. There's no question about it. Um, and they come out and basically say, if you do anything to um, touch our rebate or touch the way we calculate our fees or anything, premiums are going to go up. And because they, it, it affects their bottom line. And sure. when they come out and, and, you know, basically say, and you read my price versus cost, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it, it's, 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 the price to them doesn't make any difference. It's the cost to them. And it costs them much less, meaning they get more money when the list price is higher. It, it really is a misalignment of incentive. And so I agree with um, John Arnold on that. You know, it sort of goes, take goes back to the history of why we even have PBMs. So, I mean, that's a, a good place to start because I think they did serve a purpose for insurance companies and employers, at least in their initial um, role. One other question uh, I did want to ask, and this may be unrelated, but um, sure. uh, I've had uh, several family members who've needed throughout the years to get access to extreme, insanely expensive medications that were prescribed um, that were really, I don't know how anyone would pay for them, but somehow through the process of working through the hospital, they procured the prescription through some sort of a grant process. Um, is that well, related any way or is that, what's going on there? Yeah, so that, you know, there's, there's hospital and, and we do it in our office all the time. And it's particularly for Usually for Medicare patients or patients who are underinsured um, to get a very expensive medicine, um, either it's not on the formulary, uh, meaning the insurance company won't cover it, or the copay is so high that or coinsurance is so high that the patient can't afford it. Uh, right. uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers have set up foundations um, in order for patients to apply to get free drugs. Um, and sometimes there are income criteria and sometimes they're not. Um, you know, the, the, the PBMs and insurance companies are not happy about that uh, somehow because it keeps patients on expensive medications. Um, but yes, and most of these foundations are um, uh, funded by the manufacturer. Okay, so that's sort of a way around the PBMs from the manufacturer side, more to, probably to promote as promotional. Or you know, I, that's... I, you know, I don't, I you know, I don't view it that way. It's the same way when okay. you look at copay at, as when you look at copay cards. There are good copay cards and there are bad copay cards. You know, copay cards, insurance companies and PBMs say are used by manufacturers to keep patients on expensive drugs. Well, I would say that PBMs like to keep patients on expensive drugs as well when they choose a brand name over a, a generic because it makes them more money. But that's a different, that's a different argument. The, the right. bad copay cards are ones that pay for drugs that have lower cost alternatives. There is a product out there that is basically a combination of two over-the-counter generic drugs. They've been put together into a pill, and that pill, a month supply, costs $3,500, where if you went to your local pharmacy and bought <laughs> your own anti-inflammatory and stomach medicine, you could probably spend, I don't know, maybe $9 and get a month oh, supply. Gosh. So it's, yeah. So I'm not naming any names, but the copay card <laughs> to enable a patient to get that, that's a bad copay card. So the patient then pays yeah. $5 and your insurance then, you know, it'll cover the coinsurance of whatever, $400 a month. But then the insurance company is then, you know, charged with having to pay the other $3,000 a month for a drug you could conceivably get on your own for 10 bucks if you went. So that's a bad <laughs> copay card. The good yeah. copay cards are... When you have no lower cost alternative, you know, I, you know, whether you get Humira, Enbrel, Orencia, Benlista, you know, any of those drugs all cost about the same. 
there's no lower cost alternative. We've already been through the generic methotrexate and prednisone and, you know, right. NAPA and all of those drugs, and they don't work. And here you have a coinsurance on a $10,000 a month drug, so your coinsurance is going to be $2,000, and you don't have it. So the manufacturers yeah. cover that $2,000 and pay the PBM, pay the insurance company that $2,000, and you only pay $5, and you get the drug. That is a good copay card, because without it, none of those innovative medicines would ever be taken. Um, So either you figure out a way to lower the coinsurance for the patient, i.e., maybe let them pay their coinsurance on the net price that the PBM paid for it, not the list price. You know, but oh, no, 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 PBMs won't do that. And in fact, they've gotten it taken out of some federal legislation that the, that the patients would be able to pay on the net price. So don't complain about a copay card that without patients would not get these, these medications. Yeah. You know, let them pay their coinsurance on the net price, and then maybe they might, and you know, it, it could be for, you know, something like a neck gym, which is maybe $400 a month, and they get it for $100. And, you know, but Nexium has lower cost alternatives. And so, again, I'm not yeah. so sure that copay cards are the best for that. But when you've got no lower cost alternative and the patient's not going to be able to get the drug without the copay card, that's a good copay card. Yeah, I guess and, that. that makes sense. And so, 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 you know, the argument, and there was, I can't remember, there was Bloomberg or New York Times had a headline manufacturers use copay cards to hook, and they use the word hook, uh, on their expensive medicine. I can tell you, my rheumatoid patients are not hooked on Enbrel. They're not hooked right. on Arisia. They're not hooked on a camera. They require <laughs> in order to get out of bed in the morning. And to insinuate yeah. that is insulting, you know, yeah. to... You know, to me, because that means I'm I'm hooking my patients on expensive drugs. So yeah. you know, the idea that foundations are a promotional thing to somehow get patients onto expensive drugs where they could actually be using something else, because they all have it. You know, every single one of the manufacturers for the expensive drugs that I use have foundations. Yeah. So it's not like promoting one drug over another. It's enabling patients to get a drug that otherwise they wouldn't have been able to get. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. That makes a lot of sense. So the effective price of drugs to the consumer is probably impacted more by the middle players in the middle, in this case, the PBMs, rather than the pharmaceutical manufacturers. Well, perhaps maybe you should record me saying one other thing, because a lot of times (laughs) when when I give this lecture, people think somehow that I am carrying water for the manufacturers. And and your statement that you just made is true to a certain extent. However, I can tell you the manufacturers are not really, compl- yeah, they're complaining because they may raise the price of their drug 15%, but the, but the net increase in their profit is only 2%. I have right. no, um, I don't feel sorry for them at all. And the one thing that I, in fact, you may want to record this because the one thing I want to get across in uh-huh. talking about PBMs and and how they incentivize higher list prices, that this does not let the manufacturers off the hook for the very high prices that they charge for their medications. When you look at one of the drugs that I use that has increased in price by, you know, 600% over the last five years, there's no excuse for that. So yeah. there's more than enough blame to go around, and the manufacturers are on the hook as well. It's just that no one knows the role that PBMs play in this whole cabal, if you will. Yeah, and, yeah, and I think you hit it. Um, to me, innovation and disruption are synonymous, um, and uh, it, it sounds like it's going to require some fundamental change. I think... You know, uh, our our position at, at SMA is that, you know, the more that we can educate people on these types of things and what is happening, um, then we can have more, uh, we can have providers and patients at the table or at least uh, aware so that they can start to um, become more involved in the process. Education is always a great way to shed light on these types of things. And, 
and the time that you've spent today. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I don't know how you see patients and do all this work, too, <laughs> but I'm sure that uh, there are lots of people, us being one, really appreciate uh, what you're doing and especially taking the time today. Um, we would have, love to have you uh, on again to uh, keep us updated as things uh, progress forward. I'd be happy to, and thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to um, to explain some of this very, very uh, difficult subject, um, hopefully made a little bit clearer to your audience today. Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly it did. It, it did for me anyway. So thank you very much again. The SMA Southern Regional Assembly takes place October 31st through November 2nd in Birmingham, Alabama. The theme is the business of medicine simplified. Visit sma.org forward slash assembly for additional information.